continuing where I left off. The Rotilians, now victors with their trophies, bore the dead Bolsons into camp with tears. And tears flowed in the camp as well at finding Ramnus bled to death and many captains taken off at one stroke in that slaughter, even as Numa and Seranus were. A great crowd pressed around the dead and dying, pressed it toward the ground still fresh with carnage, foaming rills of blood. The men could recognize the trophies theirs and point them out, Masapis, shining helm, and medals now regained it that had caused toil and sweat in the attack. By this time early dawn, leaving yes. Titanus, yellow bed, scattered first rays of light over the lands of Earth, down pour the sun, the world stood clear, and Turnus in full armor, roused his men to arm. Each officer drew up his line of battle, all in bronze, and soldiers gave their anger a fighting edge, with divers aversions of the night attack. The attacker's head, indeed, a ghastly sight, they fixed on spears, and lifted and bore out in taunting parade Euryalus and Isis, Aina's men at arms in their left flank, formed the defending line along the walls, the right enclosed by river. On high towers, having the ditch before them, broad and deep, they stood in sorrow, moved by those grim heads, impaled in dripping gore, heads too well known to their unhappy fellows. In the meantime, Rumor on strong wings flying went about, the settlement in dread, until it whispered, close by Euryalus' mother's ears, then all at once warm life drained from her body, shuttle and skein unwon dropped from her hands, she flew outdoors all wretchedness and wail as women do, tearing her hair, and ran to reach the rampart in mad haste to reach the front line. Pain soldiers there no heed, no heed to danger, none to missiles. Then she filled heaven's airs with keening. Must I see you even like this, Eurelis? You that were in these last days the comfort of my age could leave me, could you, cruel boy, alone, sent into danger so, had you no time for your poor mother's last farewell? Ah, God, you lie now in strange land, carrion for Latin dogs and birds. And I, your mother, never took you, your body, out for burial, nor closed your eyes, nor washed your wounds, nor dressed you in the fine robe I had been weaving for you, night and day, in haste before the loom, easing in a woman's pain. But where shall I go now? Where is the earth that holds your trunk, dismembered all your mangled body? This, is this all of yourself, my son? that you bring back to me by sea and land? Did I keep this beside me? Put your spears into me, Rutilians, if you can be moved. Let fly your javelins at all at me, and let me be the first you kill, or else take pity. Father of the great gods, with your bolt, dispatch this hateful soul to the abyss. I can else break off my tortured life. All hearts were broken by her cries and groans, of mourning came from all, their strength for battle, broken and benumbed, at the behest of Illinus and Iolus, weeping hard. The woman, as she fanned the flame of grief, was brought inside, supported on the arms of Actor and Idus, and given rest. But now a far of trumpet sang in bronze, heart-chilling clamor, and a battle shout re-echoed from the sky as Volscanus charged on the cover of shields evenly locked to fill the moat and, tail and tear the rampart down. Some tried, to, some tried to find a way over and in with scaling ladders at points lightly manned, where gaps showed in the high line of the fenders, not so close packed. But the Trojans, trained in their long war, knew how to hold a wall. They ran all kinds of missile downs and used tough poles to push off climbers. Stones as well as a oh, deadly weight they rolled and tumbled over to crack the shield roof ranks. Nevertheless, beneath a tortoise shell so thick those troops were glad to take their chances. Yet the time came when they could not, where the massed attackers threatened. Trojans trundled a mass of stone and heaved it down to fell men in a swath and smashed their armor shell. 
Now Rutlins no longer cared to fight blind under shields, but strove to clear the wall with archery. Mesentis, in his quarter of the field, a slight to quail at, shook his Utriscan pine, his firebrand, and lobbed in smoking darts. Mesopus, Neptune's child, tamer of horses, breached the wall and called for scaling ladders. Calapi, I pray, and muses and all, inspire me as I sing the bloody work. The deaths dealt by Turnus on that day, and tell what men each fighter said to Orcus. Help me to spread the massive page of war. There was one tower of commanding height, and served by catwalks in a strategic place. Italian troops with might and main struggled to conquer this or bring it down with every trick of siege. And for their part, the Trojans held it with a hail of stones and shafts they shot through loopholes. Turnus now became the first with his thrown torch to lodge a fire at the tower side. Blazing up there with wind, it caught the planks and clung around the portals it consumed. The garrison, in panic at this horror, having no exit, herded to that side, still free of deadly fire. But the tower, out in the southern ship of weight, went down, all heaven thundering with its crash. Men dropped, half dead with all the mass of ruin to earth impelled on their own weapons or run through by cruel splinters. Lycus and Helenor barely escaped, the only ones, the young Helenor, whom a slave, Lysimenia, had borne in secret to Minos King and sent to Troy. Although forbidden arms, with naked sword and shield blank, bare of deeds, now, as he saw himself amid a thousand troops of Turnus, ranks of latins waiting here and others there as a wild beast pinned by a band of hunters in a ring will rage against their spears and hurl himself upon sure death with one leap on the spear point in the same way the young man facing death rushed at the enemy and where he saw the spears were thickets where he aimed his charge but lycus being far quicker on his feet made for and gained the wall amid the enemy amid the missiles trying to reach the top and outstretched hands of friends but on his heels ran turnus with his spear and won the race taunting him did you hope to get away you madman from our hands and taking hold of the man hanging there he tore him down with a big chunk of wall as when the bird who bears joe's boat takes wing lugging a hare or snowy swan aloft in crooked talons or when Mars wolf steals from the fold a lamb, whose mother bleating seeks it. Everywhere the shouting rose as Rutulians fought onward, filling the moat with piled up earth, while some tossed high upon the rooftops burning brands, casting a stone, a piece of mountain crag. Ionis brought down Lucius as he approached the gate carrying fire. Liger killed Emathian and Acellus killed Corineus. A javelin man won over a bowman's deafness from a distance. Canius brought Otigius down, and Cyanius, even as he triumphed, fell to Turnus. Turnus then killed Idas and Colonius, Doxopicius and Promolius, then Sagarus and Idas, high on the battles meant. But Capus killed Parvernus. First, the miller's point had grazed him so that he lost his head and threw his shield down bringing his hand up to the wound. Therefore, the winging arrow sank in his left side and deeply embedded broke the inner vents of breath with a mortal wound. In a great style fitted out, the son of Arsens stood in his cloak with figure needlework, all vivid Spanish blue, a brilliant sight, brought up in Mars wood by Samathias stream, and where Palacus altar stands enriched by offering a peaceable and mile, the young man had been sent to war by Arsens. Messenius dropped his spears, then made a sling go whipping around his head three times as he pushed, stressed upon it, and he split the adversary's temples with a molten leaden slug, knocking him down a splay on a bank of sand. At this point, it is said, Ascanius first aimed the shaft in war. In days before, he had been used to scare wild game in flight. Now, with one shot, he brought a strong man down. Numinus, Remulus by added name, who late had married Turnus's younger sister, 
Now this captain strode ahead and shouted, boast that had or had not dignity. Inflated as he was by his new status, he swashbuckled and cried, What? Not shame to be besieged again, pinned by a rampart, wailing yourselves away from death. You fragrance twice conquered it. Look, see those who claim our wives, prizes of war. What god, what madness brought you to Italy? Here are no Atridae. Here is no artful talker like Ulysses. Tough pioneers are stark. Our newborn sons we take to the river first to harden them in wilderness waves, ice cold. Our boys are keen at hunting, and they wear the forest out. Their pastimes are horse taming and archery, hard labor too in a life of poverty. Our young men are ignored too, they can crumble, earth with hooves or shake wall towns in war. Our life is worn away with iron. A spear reversed with gold and ox, and slow old age enfeebles no man's bravery or vigor. No, we press down helms on our white hair, and all our days delight in bringing home fresh plunder and good free booter fare. You people dress in yellow and glowing red. You live for sloth and you go in for dancing. Sleeve to your tunics, ribbons to your caps. Phrygian women, in truth, not Phrygian men. Climb Mount Dindima, where the devil's pipes make song for the epic, where the small drums and the Idenian mother's Barcinian box with flute are always wheedling you. Leave war to fighting men. Give up the sword. As he broadcast these insults in hard words, Ascanius could not abide the man. He turned it and set a shaft on his bowstring. Tot horse gut, and he drew his arms apart, then stood to make petition to high Jove. Almighty Jupiter, only live, consent to this attempt to venture. I shall bring thy temple's gifts in my own hands each year, and place a snowy bullock at thy altar, gold leaf on his brow, grown up to hold his head high as his mother's, then to charge with lower horns, and paw the sand with hooves. This prayer the father heard. From a clear sky he thundered on the left just as the bow sang out, frightened with doom. The springing shaft under high tension made a fearful whistle, flying to pass clean through the head of Remulus, cleaving both temples with its shank of steel. Go on, please, mock our courage with windy talk. Twice conquered Fargans return the answer to the Rutulians. Only this Ascesson is called out. The Trojans cheered, echoing him in joy, lifting up their hearts. At that moment, in the quarter of high air, Apollo, with flowing hair from the throne of cloud, looked down upon Ausonian troops and town. He spoke to the victor, Aulus, Blessed be your new-found manhood, child. By striving so men reach the stars, dear son of gods and sire of gods to come. All faded wars will quiet down, and justly in the end, under descendants of Ascaris, for Troy no longer bounds you. As he spoke, he put himself in motion out of heaven, parting the smoothly blowing winds to make his way down to Ascaris. And then he changed into an ancient man, Butus, the armor bearer of Anchises, and faithful doorkeeper in the old days. Now, an aid given Ascanius by his father, Apollo walked like Butus to the light. He had his voice, his coloring, his white hair, his grimly clinking arms. And now, he said to Ilus in his ardor, let it suffice that Numinus met death by your good shot without retaliation, son of Aenus. This feat of arms, your first mighty Apollo, grants you and heals no jealousy for the weapon matched with his. Only refrain from other acts of war. But even as thus broke into words midway in speech, Apollo quitted mortal vision, fading fast into thin air and distance. Darting captains glimpsed the god, and the gods bow and heard his quiver clanging as he went away. Therefore, despite his eagerness for battle, they kept Ascanius from it, by command and will of Phobus, while they all themselves pushed forward once again to join the fight and put themselves in danger. Battle cries ran toward 
tower to tower along the entire wall, as men bent springing bows or twisted thongs on javelins to whip them out. The ground was littered with flung missiles. Shields and helms ran out, rang out as they were hit, and the fierce fight mounted when a storm out of the west, when the young goats, the reigning stars, arise, lashes the earth, or as when clouds descend in thick hell on the deep and Jupiter, grows rough with south wind, making the downpour veer and burst the cloudy arches of the sky. Two brothers, son of Alconor of Ida, Pandorus and Bricius, who Ira, nymphs of the woods and Jobs wood, rear to manhood, tall as their native pines and hills, relying on their arms alone unbarred and open the gate their captain had assigned them. Daring the enemy to come in, the two then took their stand inside to right and left before the gate towers. They were mailed in steel, their heads adorned with high windy crests, as hard by rivers on the banks of Po or near the lovely Adage, twin oaks going soaring high in air and lift their heads into the sky with foliage uncut, and nod their utmost tops. The Rutilians now stormed the entrance when they saw it clear in a moment. Quirsons and Aquilus at handsome soldiers, and full handly Tamaris, Hammond as well, a son of the god Mars, with all their men were turned and put to flight, or else lay down their lives at the very gate. Then anger grew in fighting hearts. The Trojans shoulder to shoulder closed in on the place for combat hand to hand, and dared to swate. Elsewhere, as he raged and scattered foes, the commander Turnus heard from a messenger that, blooded with fresh kills, his adversaries were offering combat at an open gate. He dropped his action in towering rage to rush the entry and the insolent brothers, first to be brought down by his javelin cast, the first to Swarte was Antipasus, bastard of tall Sarpian by Athiban. Winging through the soft air, the Italian Cornel Shem Sanctin, deep in the chest, stuck there in the black wound's open chasm, yielded a foaming wave of blood. The steel grew warm in the transfixed lung. Then with his blade he brought down Meropus and Aramis, and then Aphinus. Finally, Biasis, the fiery-eyed, all energy of heart, not with a javelin, for he would not give his life up to a javelin, no, a pike, a great beam giving a spine with a rushing noise that struck with impetus like a thunderbolt. His shield's two bull hides were not proof against it, nor was his coat of trusty mail with lapping scales of gold. Giant-like, he reeled and fell. Earth groaned, and his great shield came thundering down, just as the bayi on the European shore. A rocky pier, first built of massive blocks, goes over as men up end into the sea, creating surface havoc with its plunge to rest deep on the seafloor, as the water seeps around it and the black sands rise. And at the crashing sound, the high peaked isle Prokash shakes, and so does Ashia. Torfin's flint bed, fixed by Jove's command. On this, the god of warfare, Mars, instilled new heart and vigor in the Latin troops, goading them on and set among the Trojans rout and black dread. The attackers flowed from every quarter. Now their chance had come, and he, the god of battle, swept their souls. Pandarus, seeing his brother in the dust, seeing where fortune laid, how the tide turned, pushed to shut the gate with his broad shoulders, turning it with a great heave on its hinge. He left outside a number of his own in desperate combat, but took others as they turned back pell-mell, demented men not to see the Rutulian prince burst into among them, close packed there. By his free act, he shut the prince inside the town, a tiger mingling with cowed cattle. Turnus' eyes shone out with new light as a deadly clang came from his armor. On his helmet crest, the plume shook red as blood, and from his shield he flashed out rays like lightning, taking it back. Iona's soldiers knew that hated face and that gigantic figure. Pandarus flared up, hot with rage for his dead brother, calling, Here is no bridegroom's royal house, from Amata, no arden in the court, to comfort Turnus with his native walls. Your enemy's fortress camp is what you see, and not the faintest chance of getting away. But smiling calmly at him, Turnus answered, Step forward, 
if you have the heart for it. Come within range, you will be telling Priam. Achilles has been found again, and here that was all, and the other man let fly his knotty spear shaft, bearing bark untrimmed with his whole strength. But only the blowing air incurred its flight, for Juno warded off impact and wound. It stuck fast in the gate, not from this blade, the stroke of my sewed arm. Will, ex will you escape? The man responsible for wound and weapon is no bungler. And I'm going to leave it off there. Thank you for watching. And um, if you like it, please give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, thumbs down. Leave a comment. Could do nothing. And subscribe or view. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye.